I, it's, been a, it's been a joy to kind of think through all of this financial stuff for the last four weeks, and I hope that you've been encouraged when it comes to this series that we've been in. It's called Jesus and Money, right? Following Jesus into a life of freedom, generosity, and joy. And for all of you who are new to Jesus, I'm grateful for um, this journey that, that, you're, that you're on, you're coming, you're trusting, that you can actually walk into a church building and learn about a lot of new things. And so um, if this has been uh, your kind of first few Sundays and it's been all about money, I still hope that you've been attracted to Jesus and really interested in him. So, so we're following Jesus into a life of freedom, generosity, and joy. And this really is part of our ongoing vision to be a people apprentice to Jesus. We're asking what it means to fully follow him we want, to what, we want to know what it's like to be fully changed and formed by Jesus. And that includes our relationship with money. Jesus, if you haven't read the Bible much, uh, just so you know, Jesus has a lot to say about money. And for these four weeks, I hope that we can begin to f- experience this freedom, this generosity, and this joy. And I know it was mentioned earlier by Lillian, but um, I'm excited about tonight at 6.30, Ron Davis coming to lead us in the workshop on kingdom finances. I'm also really excited about a new course that we're launching in April, really practical course um, uh, called Money Life. And we're gonna be, we're gonna be walking through um, how, for six weeks on Wednesday nights, um, how, to ground our vision of finances in the Bible and explore the symptoms and root causes of many of our financial challenges. And this will be an opportunity to literally bring your budget and try to like work through it and find freedom. And so, you know, it was, uh, so we have that course coming, so that's great. We have the seminar tonight. We just did four weeks in this. And one life group leader asked me this week a great question. And on the phone, we were chatting and he said, he said, what would it take to create a culture of generosity at the church? I love that question. What would it take to create a culture of generosity at the church? And so, okay, so we've done four sermons on this. We've, we've got this seminar. We've got this course coming up. But I'm like, man, even though we have sermons and seminars and courses, in the end, in the end, to create a culture of generosity in a church, it takes a whole bunch of people filled with the Holy Spirit, transformed by the good news of Jesus to walk in obedience and joy as we follow Jesus. Uh, To create a culture of generosity, it will take each one of us making a commitment to say, Jesus, I trust you. I trust you with my finances. I trust you to lead me in a way that leads to life. And so as we end this series today, today I hope to simply inspire a deep love of Jesus that leads to joy. I want to inspire a deep love of Jesus that leads to joy. So as we've begun each week, let's think about the generosity of Jesus. Paul writes this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And Jesus, we sit here with such wealth. the wealth of what we've received when it comes to your grace, your sacrificial love, your kindness to us, the forgiveness of sins, the hope of new life, the gift of your Holy Spirit. God, when we sit back and think of all that you have given us, Jesus, when we think of all that you left in order, to, in order to find us, in order to reconcile us to yourself. Lord, we, we're so grateful. And today we pray that you would teach us, that you would guide us, that you would reveal your heart to us. We love you. We trust you. Amen. Okay, so if you would, would you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 21? We're going to look at the first four verses, Luke 21, 1 to 4. And to give you a little background here, um, Jesus is in the temple with his followers, and he's watching people bring their money to the temple. 
And uh, this story has meant a lot to me ever since I was a little boy, and I uh, can't wait to preach on it here. So Luke 21, 1 to 4. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow putting in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Notice that Jesus was watching what people did with their money. And uh, I don't think this was like a Santa Claus thing. He sees you when you're sleeping. You know, he knows. It's like, have you been good or bad? It's not like that kind of watching. I think he's just genuinely watching. He's, he sees you. He sees you in your generosity. He sees the sacrifices you've made. He loves you. And so he's, he's watching. And, and he, watches, he watches the rich put in their money. And, uh, and, then, and then the poor widow put in hers. You can imagine the... The rich, as they put in their money, it's all these silver coins, denarius, and they're just kind of, you know, it's clanging around like, you know. And, uh, and then this poor widow comes up and it's like, no, do you even hear the copper coins land, you know? And Jesus says, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. She gave more. And this causes some tension inside of us because we're like, no, she didn't. She did not. She actually gave very little, it seems. She gave two copper coins. One copper coin, a lepta, in Jesus' day, um, was about one 132nd of a normal day's wage. Okay, I probably said that wrong. Um, so imagine a one over 132. Okay, however you say that. So like, so, so, this is not very much money. Now, what one day's wage was a silver denarius, and we talked about that last week. One silver denarius. So if you worked like in the field, solid hard day's work in Israel at the time of Jesus, you'd get a silver denarius. So a cop, one copper coin is one 132nd of that, right? Now, I try to do like the British Columbia math on that. So it's like, all right, so Hard day's wage, so it's like 16.75. Let's say it's minimum wage in BC. Eight hours working, that's 134 dollars a day, right? 134 dollars. So, so one 132 of that. Each coin is worth, uh, in in our money today, about a dollar, right? A dollar. So this lady puts in two dollars. Two dollars, a toonie, right? A toonie. She puts in a toonie. But Jesus says she put in more. See, in God's realm, in God's economy, in God's eyes, in God's kingdom, she's putting in way more. Do you have eyes to see how much she's actually putting in? Somehow, th these two copper coins were a delight to God as he sees the wealth that she's giving. And see, Jesus just notices how sacrificial this is. But the wealthy, they're giving, but it's not sacrificial because it's, it's not sacrifice. They're not, it doesn't cost them anything, but it costs her everything. So with two copper coins, she put in more. And Jesus is teaching us that this generosity is based not on a specific dollar amount, but that generosity comes out of this thankfulness and it's sacrificial. Randy Alcorn writes that we think we'll be generous when we have a lot more money to give, right? It's like, well, I'll be generous if I can get a raise, you know? But Jesus is like, no, oh, he cares about what we do with what we have. What do you have? What do you have? Generosity comes out of this thankfulness and it's sacrificial. I want to show you a really cool connection here. Um, hundreds of years before this moment, uh, travel back in time. It's time traveling. Hundreds of years before Jesus to King David. King David is looking for land that he can set up the tabernacle to worship God. Now, the tabernacle would later become the temple, um, and his son Solomon would build that. But David's trying to find a place to worship God, and he finds this amazing piece of land, and, and he wants to buy it. 
But the guy who owns the land, uh, Aruna the Jebusite, how cool is that? Aruna the Jebusite, it's the coolest name. Um, it, so he has the land, he owns the land, and he's like, oh, it's for King David. Okay, well, you can just have it for free. And David's like, no, I'm not gonna take it for free. This is gonna be where God is supposed to be worshiped. So he says this, First Chronicles 21, he says, no, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. I will not make a sacrifice that costs me nothing. If this is for the Lord, then it's gotta be sacrificial. That land was where David sets up the tabernacle. Then his son Solomon builds the temple. That temple gets destroyed, long story. New temple is built, second temple, on that same spot, which is the spot, the exact spot, where Jesus is as he watches the widow make her sacrificial and generous gift to God. The widow is in the same place, doing the same thing that King David had done. She would not give the Lord an offering that cost her nothing. King David, the poor widow, giving a sacrificial gift that cost them something. See, that generosity is sacrificial. I was thinking about what keeps us from sacrificial generosity. And immediately I was thinking about debt. Debt is keeping you and I from generosity. Some of the most vicious debt comes from our dear friends at Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. You know, every year those executives are lifting their champagne glasses for a toast on the billions they earned on interest payments. And while they toast to another good year, the common person is drowning in debt. And you and I can practice love for enemies with those people, right? Gee, hey, just you know, if you want to be an apprentice of Jesus, Jesus says, bless those who curse you. Okay, let's try the workers at Visa, MasterCard, and American Express, right? We can actually practice this love of enemy stuff. But you and I, were swiping the card to keep up with the Joneses. And we're so far from being able to live a life of joyful generosity. How can I be generous when I'm trying to pay off the car loans and the credit card debt, the loan for the vacation, the debt to upgrade something that did not need an upgrade? And I hope you and I can enter into a really good discussion about good debt and bad debt. And I know there's a lot of opinions around that. But I hope that you and I are grounded in a community. Well, let me ask, are you grounded in a community of a couple people, two or three people, or a life group, group of 10 or 12? Do you have a mentor, financial advisor whom you trust, someone who's walked the path before you, someone, someone who's able to kind of, you're able to think about these thoughts with, to get wisdom from, to say, I want to honor Jesus. How do we do this? But no matter where we're at with that debt conversation, the Bible's pretty clear. The Bible describes debt as slavery. Proverbs 22, the borrower is slave to the lender. Debt is so easily accepted as a normal part of life. It's so easily accepted. Like we just assume a standard of living that is beyond what we're able to pay for. Ad campaigns are centered upon you and I feeling discontent. I, you know what? It's really cool. Actually, I think a lot of you... Um, a lot of you are probably in marketing and or you're kind of thinking creatively about um, you know, ads and stuff like that. And I think you're in a great position to find a Jesus-centered way to do it, right? How, how, how is Jesus calling you with all of your skills and artistic ways of thinking to, to, to really do marketing in a way that honors um, people without making them feel like they're always lacking, you know? I, I'm sure it's hard to do, but... Jesus has you in that industry, and I wonder what it would look like. Because all the ads that I see and know are, are, are trying to tell me that I don't have enough, that I shouldn't be content, right? 
And what does it look like for you and I to be content with the shelter that we have? Whether it's been given to us, whether we're renting it, whether we own it, we just go, I have a roof over my head. There's warmth. I've got a transportation, a means of transportation, whether it's a bus ticket, a bicycle, a car, right? And God, I'm thankful. I'm grateful for what you've given me. So thankful for this thing, for what I have. I get to eat today. Thank you for my daily bread. And in that place, then I can start to ask some serious questions around debt. And, I can, and before I go into debt, I can pause and ask these questions. Randy Alcorn, uh, from his book, Managing God's Money, he writes this. Before we incur debt, we should ask ourselves some basic spiritual questions. Is the fact that I don't have enough resources to pay cash for something God's way of telling me it isn't his will for me to buy it? Or is it possible that this thing may have been God's will, but poor choices put me in a position where I can't afford to buy it? Wouldn't I do better to learn God's lesson by foregoing it until, by his provision and my diligence, I save enough money to buy it? It's good questions. See, just because I can afford it, I don't think that's God saying I should buy it. I want to repeat that because it's something I have to say to myself. Okay, often. Just because I can afford it, it's not saying that I should buy it. As, as I said last week, are we moving into the world asking Jesus, Jesus, how do you want me to navigate all the spending and saving and buying and, and giving that I do? So much of our anxiety is tied to our lifestyle expectations. Right? So much of our anxiety is tied to our lifestyle expectations. We see the lifestyle we want is here, and we feel like we're always here, always. Of course, of course we should have two cars and have that version of the smartphone and be able to eat out often and have five kinds of jackets and five kinds of boots and so our anxiety is, is, is tied to our lifestyle expectations. And when we don't reach that standard, we're either depressed as we watch the world enjoy things without us, or we live in fear because we've bought it all and we're swimming in debt. Or many of us are like, uh, some version of both, maybe. Right? But what if? What if our contentment and simplicity created financial margin to be generous? I'm going to ask that again. What if our contentment, whew, thank you, Jesus, thank you for what I have, right? And simplicity, it's this motion, <laughs> you know? So simplicity created financial margin to be generous. It's not that we actually started earning more. It's that we started living content, thankful, grateful, debt-free, and we started to taste the joy of giving. What do we need? Jesus. I, I think we need Jesus to melt our hearts. We need the love of Jesus to transform us, to give like the poor widow. And so these are the prayers we're praying. We're saying, come, Lord Jesus, step into my dysfunctional heart. Come, Lord Jesus, and heal me and free me that I'd live a life of generosity. North Langley, I think we are called to reject all guilt-driven generosity. We're called to reject all guilt-driven generosity. In the words of John, the beloved disciple, we love because he first loved us. See, we have received Jesus, the greatest gift, and so we give. We've received the love of God, so we love. This kind of giving, like the widow in the temple, is so beautiful because it comes from a place of thanksgiving. We sit back and go, oh, okay. we've, been, we've been so blessed by Jesus, by his life and his life to the full. And so we just go, okay, well, that's the place. I want to give out of that place of thankfulness. Uh, Paul the Apostle was uh, collecting a, an offering, and he was going church to church in different cities. Now, these cities were actually quite poor, and followers of Jesus, some of them were poor, but they were raising support for the church in Jerusalem that was really struggling. They were, they were living in lots of poverty, and so Paul's collecting like a, like a 
thank you gift for the church at Jerusalem to bless them, to encourage them. And he writes this. He says, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people and they exceeded our expectations. Paul's describing a lot of poor people that wanted to give. This was not guilt, right? They had this overwhelming joy in their giving. You know, had these people heard the story of Zacchaeus, who had met with Jesus at the table and had been inspired to give? Had these people heard the story of the widow at the temple, had heard the story of her two copper coins, and had it inspired them to give? They gave even though they were living in this extreme poverty. I feel like I'm tempted to give token gifts that soothe my guilt, right? I know I should give something, so I'll just give a token gift. Maybe it's to get the person off of my front doorstep for whatever they're raising money for. It's like, yeah, here's a 20, just please leave, you know, kind of soothes our guilt. Or I can, I, I'm tempted to give without changing my lifestyle. Or I'm tempted to give in order to get. How much can I give this year to maximize my tax return? How much can I give in order to work myself into a tax bracket that's better for me? You know, it's all these, how can I give in order to receive the applause of humans, you know? Man, those are tricky questions. And again, ones that you and I are probably going to have to navigate. Well, we do have to navigate in life. And I hope we're doing it together with those that love us. So there's all kinds of bad ways to be generous, right? But listen to the heart that God wants us to have as we give. Paul writes this, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you want, you will abound in every good work. Are you awake, North Langley? <laughs> having all that you need, <laughs> you'll abound in every good work. Need, oh, okay, it didn't say want. Having all that you want. Um, having all that you need. Uh, I've heard this verse since I was little, and uh, I always felt like it was, um, like an attack verse, you know? Hey, Matthew, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. That's kind of the tone that I hear that verse in. And I'm like, right, huh, you know? Um, obe you know, obedience, duty, these are the things that, you know, it's like, okay, I'm gonna give. But I know God loves a cheerful giver. And I know that this is tricky to work out because oftentimes, and I'll say more about this later, but sometimes I have to give obediently and my heart will follow. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I start to give, and I go, you know what? My heart will catch up on this one, <laughs> you know? But I know that God wants to get me to a place where I am cheerful in my giving, where I'm thinking about all the ways I can give. And that's a journey we go on as apprentices of Jesus. I think about the early church. They gave so generously to one another Right? They were filled with the Spirit and they gave. And many of you know the story where there were no poor among them. Just listen to that again. No poor among them. Here's the passage. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from the sales, put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Unbelievable. There was no needy persons among them. Such rich generosity in the early church. Could that inspire you and I to give? To say, God, we would love to see a place where both the, all those who, are, who worship with us, um, that there is no poor among us, that we give generously to one another, but also to our global family, 
the believers around the world who struggle day to day, right, to care for them and to care for those outside the church, those who are just living in extreme poverty, those who need clean water, all the above, to the hurting of our city, right, that we would just give, and there are incredible organizations to give to. I just want to highlight um, the Wellspring organization that does incredible work um, in education in Rwanda. We've been partnered with them for a while. I've been to Rwanda. I've seen the work that they've done. It's Jesus-centered. It's loving. Or the work of Kuwasha. Some of you know Kuwasha in Uganda. I've been there too and just seen the work that God has done at, through Kuwasha, loving the poor in a Jesus-centered way. We could go on. There's so many incredible organizations. And sometimes the question comes up like, okay, so what percentage do we give to, to, to global things? And what percentage do we give to the local church? And, and, that, and that's complicated sometimes. And, and just so you know, there's good Christians who think different things about that topic, just so you know. And they all sound right. This is wild. Um, and so he, I, I think the best thing to do is, once again, uh, to say it a third time, is to be walking, uh, sensitive to the Spirit, asking Jesus, and listening to wisdom around you, and just going, okay, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm processing. Um, and some of us, uh, we've asked the question, you know, why give to the local church when there are people around the world who are dying, who need clean water? That's a really good question. And I think that there's something there in the tension of that. Um, and, and, and so for, for any of you wondering, you might be new to Jesus. You're like, why, why do people give to their local church? You know, what, one of the ways I would answer that is just to say it's home. It's our spiritual home. Um, this has been the journey that I've been on to just see, you know, the widow gives to the temple, right? And the temple and the church are kind of apples and oranges in some ways. But what they represent together is a place of worship. The place, the local church, is where we worship as a family. It's our spiritual home. This is where high schoolers and middle schoolers find community and grow in their faith in Jesus. This is a place where little children are brought to Jesus and they encounter his love. This is a place where many find hope as they struggle with mental health. This is a place where many find freedom from addiction. This is a place where many have found healing as they've walked through divorce, where many have been cared for as they've walked through grief, where we've found healing in our marriages, where we've met spiritual friends who've walked with us and pray for us and care for us in our deepest valleys. This is home where a group of faithful people are preparing meals for our street friends on Sunday nights where memorials are hosted and offered at no cost to grieving families in our city, where hundreds of kids pack into this place every summer to hear about the love of Jesus. This is a place where around tables and a warm meal, people are starting their new relationships with Jesus. This is home, this is our spiritual home where we come together and there's a prayer team ready to minister to us and our musicians lead us in worship and where we gather to celebrate people coming up out of the water behind me with new life. This is where we gather around the table and we eat the bread and drink the cup to remember the cross. This is our home. And I wanna thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I genuinely mean that. I'm so grateful for our church family. There's been this rich generosity that has poured forth, as you said, this is my home, this is my spiritual home, and I know God is leading me to give. And so as you and I, as we, as we keep this place warm, as we keep the lights on, as we keep the doors open, we offer a space to encounter the living God. And so I don't know where Jesus is gonna take you on this journey. We need to give to clean water. We need to give to extreme poverty. We need to give to education all around the world. So, so work it out, you know? <laughs> uh, this is a joy to go like, okay, Lord, how do I do this, you know? Let's, let's work with some wisdom. Let's get some friends around me. Let's, let's, let's pray about this, and let's work it out and figure it out. You know, I, I know that we all feel like we don't have much to give, um, my mom tells this story, I've told you guys this before, but she's, she was a school counselor for, for, for many years. And, uh, and she told me about this little boy named Carson who at her school was a bit distraught one day. Um, the kids at the school that my mom worked in were all raising support for a cause. Um, and all, this little guy really wanted to give, but he didn't have any money. 
and all the money was due Friday. And so my mom said that little Carson walked up to his teacher and said, I really want to give, but I don't have any teeth I can lose before Friday. <laughs> you know, where am I going to get the money? You know, the tooth fairy is usually giving, uh, yeah, the tooth fairy, by the way, that's gone up. Uh, <laughs> it's my own kids. I'm like, wow. I don't have anything to give, we say, right? But generosity takes experimentation and creativity. Can I just encourage us to have fun with this? Experiment with it. Be creative with it. It's our, it's our whole lives. It's not our money. We're in a series on money, so we're talking about money, but it's our whole lives. We could equally do this, this Sunday and talk about our home and our cars and talents and our minds and all of it. How can we use all of it richly and generously to bless others? One Scottish pastor once wrote, quote, to give largely and liberally, not grudging at all, requires a new heart. <laughs> it requires a new heart. Oh God, I need a new heart, please. Jesus cares deeply about our heart, and he tells us something fascinating about our heart. He says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wait, okay, hold on. Where my treasure is, that's where my heart is? My heart follows the money. That's what Jesus is saying. So where does the money go? Well, follow the money, and that's where your heart is. See, we always like to think it's the other way around, right? Like, well, when I have a passion for something, then I'll give to it. But let's think honestly about our life. Is that always true? Or is it sometimes that we begin to give obediently, faithfully, and then all of a sudden we find the cheerfulness coming, <laughs> and all of a sudden we find the joy following, right? That the joy is following the money. So when we're generous... Could it be that God starts to heal our heart and it draws us closer and closer to Jesus? Our series has been called Jesus and Money, following Jesus into a life of freedom, generosity, and joy. And I hope that that's what you are experiencing, freedom, generosity, and joy. And we're going to end with the gospel. It's Communion Sunday. And so would you take the bread and the cup and I'm going to invite the ushers to walk up and down the aisles if you missed grabbing the, the bread and the cup as you came in today, would you just raise your hand? Um, the ushers would love to, to pass one over to you. That would be great. Does everyone have theirs? Okay. Thank you all so much. Thanks to our usher team. As we end thinking about the gospel, I want to draw your attention to Jesus. Only a short walk from the temple, from that place where he saw the widow, on a hill, he would give up his entire life in loving sacrifice like the widow offering two copper coins, like David offering a sacrifice that cost him something, Jesus would give up everything to have you. I'm gonna repeat that. Jesus would give up, give up everything to have you. You're his treasure. You're the one he loves. And so if you forget everything I've said this morning, just remember you are the one he treasures. And it's his deep love to free up your heart and my heart to lead us to joy. And so we think about the cross. I encourage you, just if, if you would like to, just close your eyes. See the cross of Jesus when he poured out his blood, gave up his body. Would you just come quietly, confessing your sin,
asking to be filled with his love again. Jesus, we come to your table again and we take the bread and the cup and we see how loving you are and how loved we are. Northangly, as we take the cup and the bread, let's start with the bread. And we hear the words that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink the cup together. North Langley, can we stand together? As we end our time in prayer here, a reminder that our prayer team is going to be up here up front. And one of the things, in the prayer room as well, but one of the things they said to me this morning, the prayer team, is that for any of you who just need to know that Jesus sees you and that he sees what your giving has cost you, that you would receive his love in a fresh way. If you're just looking to receive the love of God, would you come forward, receive prayer? If any of you are just sensing this need to, to um, be freed up, you know, uh, come forward for prayer. Go, go to our prayer room for prayer. They would love to pray for you or for anything else that's going on in life. But Jesus sees you. He sees the sacrifice that many of you have made. And so let's, let's pray here. Lord Jesus, as we come again to the cross, we see this declaration that we are your treasure. Thank you for treasuring us. Now, may we love like you have loved us. Send us out, Lord Jesus. May every penny that you have given us, may we release it back into your hands. Set us free. Make us generous. Fill us with joy. We love you, King Jesus. Amen.